My out-of-studio partner on today's program is Greg Durrell. Greg, thanks for joining me on According to God's Word. Oh, Tom, it's a pleasure to be with you. We are going through the book of Romans, and we're getting close, Greg. We're not going to finish it up today, but uh, we are in chapter 15, and we're going to pick up with verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, of course, we have to put this in context for our listeners. What's Paul referring to here? What is this business of being strong and and then bearing the infirmities of the weak, Greg? Well, it's certainly not about physical strength. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it follows on what we would refer to as chapter 14. Remember, to to all our listeners, and and certainly most of them know this, but Paul, nor any of the the writers of the New or the Old Testament, wrote in chapter and verse. So it's always good to go back and reread the epistle from the beginning all the way to this point. Mm -hmm. But Paul's telling us that it's imperative that we not be self-centered believers, people who are mature, we have an obligation. And when he says, we then that are strong, ought, that phrase there, verb is present tense, and it talks about our continuing obligation to bear the infirmities or the spiritual weaknesses and shortcomings of others in Christ, and certainly not to please ourselves. Mm -hmm. And discipleship is part of that, encouragement. Basically, what we're doing right here, in one sense, could be construed as being part of that, because we're trying to help, perhaps, new people in the Lord to grow in Christ and understand fully what the Lord wants them to become. Right. And, you know, as we mentioned in uh, in weeks past, going through chapter 13, 14, and now heading into 15, Paul was addressing a situation that was interesting. Many of those who were believers in Rome, they were Jewish, and they had come out of the law, so they had a sense of the law, and maybe some even were were legalistic, which they were trying to change. On the other hand, there were many Gentiles or non-Jews, and they came out of a background of paganism. So for these two groups (laughs) to work together, to be of one heart and one mind, certainly Paul presented the truth to them. But, you know, you can present the truth, but now how somebody is going to respond to it, how they are going to implement it, apply it to their lives, uh, that's where you can have real trouble. So Paul here is not talking about essential doctrines. He's not talking about the gospel, what is the gospel, what isn't the gospel. He's talking about issues that really some would say, well, they're non-essentials. They have to do with uh, treating somebody in an area where what they were going to eat or what they weren't going to eat, or some would look at a a day and say, no, this is a holy day, this is what we need to do, and so on. So in those areas where we have freedom, Paul is saying, look, you who are strong, in other words, you who are mature in the faith, who really trust in God's Word, and you have somebody among you who doesn't have the understanding that you have, or maybe the maturity that you have, you've got to love them. You've got to help them along. You can't be out to just please yourself. You know, sometimes, Greg, I I think about my own growth in the Lord, and I could look back early on and say, man, I wouldn't want to be around you. You know, I kind of wanted to be right rather than righteous. If it was a subject, you know, that I would argue about, you know, I'd get louder even if I didn't know what I was talking about. You know, that was a dead giveaway. Sure. So, but God is talking about, the Lord here is talking about through the Apostle Paul, of maturity. And look at the next verse, verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And verse 3, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Well, surely. And and it's, uh, I think conduct would be a word here Mm -hmm. that that could be uh, applicable. It's a focus where many young Christians just lose sight of Christ. And as you pointed out, there were Jewish converts, there were pagan converts. So many people want to bring their traditions into their relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of being young in Christ. And it takes someone who is strong, as in verse 1, strong in conviction, strong in spiritual maturity, uh, to, to bear that infirmity, not to enable them so that they will continue in their ignorance, but to share with them. His whole point in chapter 
14. Maybe a good uh, summary verse would be 14, 16, where he says, let not your good be evil spoken of. Mm -hmm. So again, our conduct, we're to be Christ-like, and we're to demonstrate those things. And his point that Christ didn't come simply to serve himself, but he came to serve others. John 4 and and other places would testify to that. So the the focus or the, the direction here is for you and I who are spiritual, you and I who are strong, not to leave others behind, not not to just go on and think we have no responsibility for our fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. The reality is, as he points out in verse 1, we do have a continuing obligation Mm -hmm. to bear the infirmities of the weak. Mm -hmm. You know, Greg, I I like this, uh, you know, you kept using the the word strong. That's what the, the King James says, when we then that are strong. I was just thinking, would you like to, uh, not you, Greg, but any, any of our listeners out there, you want to test and see if you're strong, strong in the faith? You know what, what uh, quality comes to mind? Long-suffering. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it sounds like the antithesis, but if somebody is faithful, is long-suffering, is diligent, all of these things are marks of maturity. These are the things men, you know, oh, Lord, help me to be, uh, to be long-suffering. Because it, it, what it does is... It puts somebody else before yourself. You're bearing with them. You're going to bear their burdens. You're going to help them out. You're going to there for their sake. And, Greg, what would happen if everybody was like that? We'd have a taste of heaven, wouldn't we, right here on earth? Well, we sure would, Tom. And, you know, why don't you read verse 4? Because verse 4 is really reaffirming what you just said. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. See that word patience there? It's an interesting Greek word. It's, it's hupomene, and it, it brings with it the connotation of, of bearing up under a load. Mm-hmm. It talks about steadfastness in face of uh, adversities. And just what you're talking about, this, this long-suffering, this perseverance, this thing, that, that, that mindset— and so what is Paul saying? He says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through this patience, and then he says, and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And that's a marvelous thing. You know, we've talked about it before, I think, in our study of Romans. Uh, the word hope, New Testament or Old Testament, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, uh, it has a different meaning than really our English word hope. Mm-hmm. Our English word hope is sort of a, a word that has you know anticipation to it. Now, in other words, we're we're sitting in anticipation of something. We're hoping, but in Greek and Hebrew, it's different. It, it's a given. It's a done deal. And so when Paul's talking about this through this patience, and then he says, "And comfort of the scriptures, we have hope." What is our hope? Our hope is the coming of the Lord. Our our hope is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Our our hope is the leading, guiding direction of the Lord from within. That brings us to that level of spiritual maturity where we can stand strong and then even bear the infirmities of the weaker brethren. Mm -hmm. Our desire, and every believer's desire, is should be be to help all reach some level, some some, uh, level of maturation in their lives where they are productive and, and where they can truly experience the, the, the joy and the fellowship of Christ. Right. Greg, the, the first part of that verse, it just, uh, it, it's, it's so wonderful in terms of encouragement. Let, let me just go back over it. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And of course, the latter part talks about the comfort of the scriptures, the Old Testament. We get to see, we have the benefit of all those things that took place we see God interacting with man, whether it be to comfort, encourage, to bring conviction, to bring discipline. Uh, you know, you think about the book of Judges. You, you see God working through the, you know, the heroes of the faith like Gideon and so on. You see God uh, dealing with David and so on. All these things were written for us to, to get to know the, and understand through God's word the character of God himself. You know, I, I remember... As a young believer, I was, it was a kind of a social function, and there were a number of evangelical Christians there and, and some pastors, and, and I was sort of standing by and uh, listening to a conversation, and it, there was a, an associate pastor there, and he was a young guy, you know, a little younger than me, and, and uh, <laughs> he was talking about the Old Testament, and I thought I'd throw my two cents in, Greg, and I said, well, you know, I have problems with the Old Testament. 
You know, it's like, um, you know, the God of the Old Testament, it just doesn't seem like, uh, you know, the God of the New Testament. And uh, nobody laughed or anything like that. And he looked at me, and then he was kind, and he said, well, have you ever read the Old Testament? <laughs> no, I hadn't. I mean, I read a little bits and pieces here, but I'd never read it, Greg. You know, in fact, I didn't know what I was talking about, but I bring that up because there are a lot of perceptions that we have that are not based on really God's truth, really getting God's word, getting to know his character. Sure. And that's what, that's a great exhortation that we have here. Isn't there another verse, uh, is, it, um, is it in Corinthians, I'm not sure, First to Second Corinthians, it talks about these things that happened beforehand were in, in samples or examples for us and so yeah. on. Well, and, and Paul says that the Old Testament, in essence, was written for our admonition. Right. And, you know, you, really that word for our learning here, you, we could spend a whole month just talking about all the things that we could learn and should have learned up until this time. And certainly one thing would be clear if you read the Old Testament, that there would only be one way for eternal life, one way to approach the Lord, right. uh, had to be by sacrifice, but through a perfect sacrifice, etc. In other words, everything that Paul clearly lays out in the first eight chapters of the book can clearly be learned from the Old Testament. And Paul says that in the beginning of this epistle, that this truth of salvation through faith in Christ alone was not hid from the prophets. It wasn't hid from the fathers. It was there in the Old Testament. And so clearly there's a basis for comfort. There's a basis for hope. And if we've learned anything from reading the Scripture, starting in Genesis, moving even to this point here, it's that salvation's a finished product. Faith in Christ brings everlasting life. Now, when we understand that and begin to grow in that truth, then the levels of maturity begin to blossom. And as Paul's commented in chapter 10, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing or understanding the Mm -hmm. Word of God. And that's where many of our religious friends miss the mark, because all their time is spent focused on religious endeavors, Mm -hmm. not reading the Scripture, as you were at one point, sort of rebuked in a sense, where someone said, gee, have you ever read it? Right. And the answer is, well, gee, no, I haven't. What yeah. a great thing, you know, to, mm-hmm. to then sit down and read that and yeah. then see all those things. Because the New Testament becomes so much clearer, has so much more value if you understand the old. Right. You know, another verse that I was thinking about, just to back up exactly what you said, and it's, it's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Remember the Bereans? Acts 1711. Mm -hmm. Well, you had the Apostle Paul coming from Thessalonica into the Greek city of Berea, and he goes into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these weren't believers. These were Jews. And Luke, who I believe wrote Acts, says he commends the Bereans because it says they search the scriptures daily in effect, to see if what the Apostle Paul was saying was true. They search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so now, what scriptures did they have? They didn't have the New Testament, right? That's right. That's right. So it's written for our edification and for our blessing. And uh, as I said before, you get to see God revealed through his prophets. You, you see him working in the hearts and minds of, of people, of his creation. You know, and it's important in a closing note for our audience to, to understand, you must reason from the known to the unknown. You don't approach the Old Testament with all sorts of preconceived notions of what you think should be there. Mm -hmm. Just read it and see what it says, and then allow that truth that you have to come forth into the New Testament. And then you're going to find the book sort of then just unfolds like a beautiful flower. Everything is is in unity. There there is a total flow from cover to cover. Failing to do that is detrimental. Please visit our website thebereancall.org to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. 
Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24-7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.